Well, I was a draftee. I was not particularly a hawk. I mean, I was a dove. I dropped out of college to get married and and support a child that was being born. And for some crazy reason, I thought, hmm, we've got a baby. I won't be drafted, <laughs> you know. It was almost surreal. I did not really realize uh, practically until I was on the bus and headed to Fort Benning that, hey, they they took me. I'm going, <laughs> you know. I went to Vietnam just before Christmas in 1969. I was assigned to the second company of the 501st Airborne Division, which was part of the 101st Airborne. I thought, I'm not um, airborne. I mean, you know, I've never jumped out of an airplane. I bet you they're going to make me a clerk. <laughs> and, of course, that wasn't anywhere near the truth. I was there, well, practically a year. And, you know, you'd go months, nothing. You'd almost get complacent. In fact, my guy said they didn't like for me to walk point. That's usually one of the first jobs of uh, a new guy. They put me on the machine gun um, squad or team <laughs> because they didn't want me to walk point because I had an attitude. And that attitude was is I had given up any thought about whether I accepted that I was going to die. They felt like I was just a little bit too careless or too reckless for the guys because I made them nervous. Gully's walking point again, he, um, he don't give a shit whether he walks into an ambush or not. There's only a handful of the guys that were experienced. The rest of us were new recruits. The, Train of thought was if you were a cherry and that you could survive six months, that you would probably make it through your tour and get back home. The reason being that the first six months you're learning all these little things like how to keep your socks dry, how to keep your head down you know, what to do to survive. And most of us, most of us just wanted to get our time done and get back home. So most of the action that I saw was against the uh, North Vietnamese regulars, just like, uh, you know, we were regular army. The most significant action took place after monsoon season. You know, American forces would have to go back and retake ground hilltops that they had had the summer before. Because when the monsoons would come, they'd move out. The, the NVA would move in. July 7th, I was on Firebase Ripcord when it was overrun by um, um, the NVA. They wanted those of us in my squad to split up and each of us go with a different squad kind of so each team would have at least one experienced guy. We didn't want to do that because we had been together through up at that point, you know, a good six, eight months of our tour together. We knew each other's habits. We knew who we could count. They knew not to put me on point. Firebase Ripcord was taking a lot of um, uh, artillery from the uh, North Vietnamese. We were on that hill, and um, I remember we were there for several days, and I was beginning to feel uneasy because if I looked off to the right, we could see 
the lightning and the fire from a skirmish or whatever you want to call it on a hill to our right, which meant they were getting hit. Our lieutenant had called in and wanted either for them to reinforce us or us to be moved. And one of the orders was that no, we were gonna stay in place, that we needed to be there. I later found out from a friend, the comment had been made is no, we're gonna leave them there, talking about my company. We're gonna leave them there and we'll find out just how good they are. That bothered me because it was my reality that I found that you don't play games with guys' lives. If you know that they're coming up the left side of the hill and are in full, you know, hell, you call them up on the phone, I think, and say, all right, guys, they're coming up on the left side. We'll send artillery in there, you know. There was a huge tree. It had fallen and, gosh, if you stood up, it would come up to your chest. One of the guys said, well, we can set the gun up on this side of that log, looking over the log and down the hill, and behind us would be the uh, CO tent and the center of our uh, circle. I told him, I said, no, dig your hole on the other side of the, uh, of the log. My thinking was, I said, we set out the Claymore mines down the hill. We see them coming. We're in the hole. We can defend ourselves because otherwise, if we're on the back side of that tree, they crawl right up on top of us. They'd literally be on the other side of the log. We might not even know they were there. My uh, judgment overruled, <laughs> and that's what we did. Well, by the next morning, the Southers overran the opposite side of the hill behind me. If we had been dug in on the back side of that log, they would have been to our back. Us being on the other side of the log, they really didn't know we were there. My squad was the only squad left out of my platoon. Well, I guess the old saying that um, you know, the poor guys fight the rich man's war. And I came away out of Vietnam with a lot of those kind of feelings. Once I got back, I just wanted to get back into my life. I can't, it's kind of like when I came home, I, for a long time, I just wiped the memory clean. Got a divorce very quickly after I came home. My wife, um, I didn't realize that I made her nervous. I made her uneasy because, uh, as she put it, I had changed. I didn't see that. I thought I was still the same old guy. To me, I was just, Still rustling. I didn't see me through her eyes. And so we got a divorce. I actually tell others that I'm not that religious, but yet at times I see things throughout my past that that's the way I was raised with the faith. And then I see little things that um, just tell me I'm blessed because I've got. Um, three kids now, and um, four grandkids, and I'm just, I'm a very lucky guy.